All right, we're recording. I'm at uh, the estuary in Parksville. This actually tree, you see me pointing to here. This is the top of a tree, at least as tall as any of these. It must have fallen, uh, you know, over the winter. It's a new addition to the path, and I've just it's taken me two trips through here today just to to really appreciate um, this wood. <laughs> And where it came from. We're just looking around. Like, oh, you know, what tree did this come from? And sure enough, there's a massive stand over here. That this this was, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe 75, 60 to 75 feet away. And this is the top of that tree. And uh, you might not think that's terribly tall. But, uh, I don't know, maybe more than that. Maybe 100 feet. It's a little hard to, to think how big this tree was. It looks like it, it fell apart in pieces of some kind. And, uh, hmm. Yeah. In any case, um, so uh, I think we live in a world where people believe uh, what they're told about a good many things and which seem, should be should be considered quite fine, except for the fact that they subsequently lose the ability to think of alternative facts, if you will. And one of those things is the distance to the sun, the canopy. So most people will live their whole lives under the canopy um, that they were told about through modern mythology and or science. <laughs> and it might even be that mythology or mass mythology is just a very old way of controlling people. For good or ill, control kind of is a bad name, but I've talked about this before. I mean, you don't have to impute total evil to mythological control of man. I'm not comfortable uh, immunizing it from scrutiny. I think something terrible has gone wrong, but let's try to be as even-handed as we can and say that mass mythology may well have been Logistic, an logist, a logistical imperative over tens of thousands of years. People believing stories uh, that, one, occupy and satisfy um, certain types of brain function and allows them to get along with the types of transformations and relationships they need to uh, put themselves into um, while still contending with the challenges that one faces um, and that in fact will stimulate a lot of mental growth, growth if you're allowed to confront those challenges uh, with, without having to bring too much stress from the rest of your life or precisely because you bring so much stress from the rest of your life you need a place to confront the great challenge of understanding your life as a whole understanding what's happening to it and uh in my life, um, I had to be very patient in trying to, different stages of waiting for my life to heal. And a lot of those times, a lot of that time, I didn't feel like I had anything I could do with it. There was, there was no cure. Um, There's no cure for just feeling sad about a lot of unceremonious changes to your, your position in life and with relationship to your biological family without harping on it too much. I think this is a, for all of our complaining and unraveling, a much <coughs> neglected area um, of people's lives, I think. You know, on the one hand, I think it's quite obvious to say that a lot of families have been under inordinate stress for many, many generations. On the other hand, there doesn't seem to be any ready means or vernacular, or time, energy, uh, mythology to to give people a way of not only perhaps understanding a, a, a quite an overwhelming scale of undue stress and injury to the mass mind of men. And, uh, you know, what we've, how we've rallied well and how we haven't, and uh, how we might secure for ourselves a therapeutic space, a therapeutic consideration, even if we have to force a hand of the world to give it to us. To give us a little bit of something that we don't have to work our balls off <laughs> in order to get. Because there's such a thing of working too hard. You know, there's, there's, there are costs for things, however valuable, that are simply not to be borne. So in, in calculating the distance of the sun to the earth, I arrived at the number 14. What I found is that 93 million miles, which is the number quoted uh, to people in the uh, communist education system, 
uh, when you divide that by 40, you get a number that whose numerals add to 12. 93 adds to 12. And when you multiply it by 40, you get a number uh, whose numerals add to 12. Just thought that would be interesting to mention to people when you're looking for relationships. I thought, I wonder if the two numbers are related. If the 40 is accurate and the 93 million is uh, something that's been contrived, perhaps we'll see some relationships between the two. <coughs> Indeed, we do. See the number 12. Uh, another thing recently I've been thinking about is um, the idea that each season represents a year. So as a 44-year-old man, I'm roughly 170-some-odd years old, that every season represents a discrete year of birth, maturity, and death. And by this might we observe the nature of death from a, a, a quite a fertile vantage point and have, indeed, I hope, a good amount of time to do so. I hope some people can find that as stimulating and profound as I do. Another thing I've been working on is a recalibration of the uh, correlation between the visible spectrum and the human chakra system. I'm now using the crown chakra as orange as a base point, the heart as purple, uh, the first chakra as yellow, the second chakra as green, and the third or solar plexus as blue. I find that amazing. The first chakra then is yellow, not the third chakra. And I said even a year ago how people in cults, I argued, were using their third chakra as their first chakra. They were confusing the functions of those chakras. And so you end up first three actually, and using, exerting your will in order to both dismiss and exploit the object of your affections, right? Let's just say the object of your affections. That is a sociopathic function, it has a sociopathic communicable value, and one is well advised to listen to it. And to remark upon its existence is to enter into a new existence entirely where, um, as much as Eric Dollard started looking at fourth-dimensional space-counter-space interactions and the actual uh, force of what we call electricity or the dielectric force, I believe new brain functions need to be awakened in order to confront um, the, the medium in which we take our lives and how much both being deprived of a certain kind of medium and being overexposed to another kind of medium which has impersonated the prima materia, the waters of our mother. And in turn, I think, the development and even conceptual or mythological framework of what you might call the tree of life. So I've touched on a few subjects now in less than ten minutes. I think that's pretty good for a self-taught druid who smokes a little too much weed and likes to whack off in the woods every now and then. So the solar plexus, yeah, 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 yeah. the yellow floats in the blue of the solar plexus. And the green and red used in politics is actually the second chakra and the third eye. Or the blue and red, I should say. And the third eye right, shares the number three with what's typically called the third chakra. And if you look at the colors blue as they make purple, it's it's uh, it's not unreasonable to suggest that the third eye chakra and the third blue chakra, the solar plexus, are integral to the function of the fourth purple chakra, the heart. It's a completely different way of looking at things, and I've shown you, hopefully in this video, that there's some reason to suggest, as with the distances to the sun and so forth, that things have actually been magically altered. 
And it, I would say maybe it may just may be that one of the biggest things we need to do to help our lives is to return the root chakra to yellow. When I was a kid, I was always confused because of my earliest memories. I remember the world being saturated in almost like a yellow filter. And this state memory is a very strong impression. I believe I was actually in tune with my first chakra. And if you're not meditating on the right color, if you look around you, like in these woods, how much of the color yellow actually comes out deeper than anything? It's a deep yellow because it's tinged in everything. Right? If something has a tint, you get the sense that it's tinted with something. It's something very deeply laid, layered within it. Even in a green woods, you see an enormous amount of yellow. I think that the, the, the color yellow is well worth meditating on as a root chakra. And yet, one of the most powerful colors that we have, the sun, is painted yellow. What does that tell you? It tells you that we may actually be inside the sun. And that the chakra allowed, that has a lot to do with our will and the force of our mind, ability to extend and express energy is blue like the sky. Don't give it to Archangel Michael as Greg fucking Bragan wants you to. That's your fucking chakra. And there's what's what floats in that blue? Your solar plexus. Solar. That's your mind. There's your mind. They come together, and it's connected to your heart. It's like you need the sun in the sky. Just need, like you need the, the red eye, the evil eye of your third eye. We need the purple energy of our heart. There's just different types of relationships that can be explored. I, I'm really new to it myself. Green is such a prevalent color in our forest. I'm really pleased with the idea that the second chakra is associated with green in the Chinese, or a Chinese system, the liver, which is roughly around the second chakra and the third chakra, is green. It's spirit, so-called spiritual energy is green. It's been a good day. I, uh, I have some complaints. I wish it were possible to meet someone, man or woman, that didn't have a mental illness. I mean, I know I have viewers. I'm not talking about viewers of mine. Um, you know, people that... Uh, didn't have any kind of at least two prominent psychosis. It's really something. I made a video with a man the other day, and it's just fascinating to watch him provoke people purposefully or make, for as smart as he claims to be, just do things that just seem to have no logical purpose. And a lot of these people that you meet, you know, they, they complain and this and that, but they're terrified of ever changing ever really growing in their life. He needs to get on disability and I don't think he ever will bother. He doesn't seem to think he can even go to a doctor. He's grown up on the island his whole life. He doesn't seem to have a doctor. So it's all a little odd. And uh, Yeah, I very intelligent though. Hmm. It's hard. It's hard to watch. I'm a, I'm a very lucky man. Knock on wood. That I made it through my life without... Such, such a prominent kind of psychosis so far, knock on wood. The uh, thing is, I just have to prove that to myself every day. I think having a closer band of comrades who is, uh, who, among whom we could trust each other's mental health and consistency and just the power of our hearts, at least as we would be well advised to reserve it for people worthy of our hearts, which I hope would be each other, I'm not sure if I can really prove my worth to myself. I don't think one is meant to prove one's worth in complete isolation, but may I be worthy of the time that I can spend in this incredible house of house of the Lord. 
That's just personal knowledge, billions of years old, that our bodies and the flesh of our spirit inherit by birth. I don't want them to be just words. I want to feel, I want to live that. That inheritance should have some heft to it. Think whatever you want. Make all the meanings you want. Give yourself that liberty. Things mean an awful number of things in order to stay alive. Think not that you are the only one with a mind. You are only the one with your mind. And you have the ability to test the metal of other minds. And if you should, as I have, lay your heart and your mind upon some very weary minds, often drawn back in a kind of compulsive neurochemical snarl, um, you would have become a little weary. doesn't seem like that's the way the world is supposed to be, and I don't think it's supposed to be that way either. But we who travel many distances alone and who are careful to stay humble enough to reach our goal, we will find one another and we will have a mighty, a mighty tradition to share. We we'll have mighty stories to sell. Hearts purified by the greatest of poisons because we remain true to who and what we are. Indeed, we could do no less. We are the true people.